Good morning, everyone. So you heard a lot about robots already. So we have to find new things to, to talk about uh, in the field of robotics. So as you can see, uh, among our panelists, we have uh, a particular type of uh, robotic companies, um, which is uh, the drone companies. So we have two of them with us today. Um, and uh, we have a speaker from Aldebaran Robotics uh, um, that you already heard about earlier, the, earlier today, and, uh, and also a researcher in the, uh, the field of robotics. So I'll start with a very quick self-introduction, and then I'll um, turn to the panelists so that they, they can introduce themselves, and uh, we'll, we'll start the discussion. So my name is Benjamin Joff. I work with uh, Accelerator. We are uh, an accelerator for hardware startups based in Shenzhen, China. And uh, we invest in uh, hardware companies, and so far we invest in 50 companies. And in the last batch of companies, we had 10, and six of them were in the robotics field. So we really see that robotics is taking off and sometimes taking very, very strange shapes. Not really the, the robots you would imagine if you read like uh, 60s, 70s, 80s science fiction. So um, without further ado, let's uh, turn to Peter. Uh, can you maybe tell us more about uh, what you're working on and uh, your, your experience with robotics? Sure, thank you, Ben. Um, hi, I am Peter Abiel from UC Berkeley. Um, what I'm interested in is how to get robots out of manufacturing environments into more unstructured environments like homes, offices, surgical operating rooms, and what I think about a lot with my students is how to build the artificial intelligence for the robots, how to make them think, and especially how to make them learn, either from watching people do things or through trial and error on their own. Type of tasks we've looked at are robots doing laundry, um, basic surgical tasks, and also some extreme helicopter aerobatics. Okay, which leads very well into what you guys are doing. Uh, my name's Eric, I'm with DJI. Uh, we make the very popular Phantom flying camera, and uh, our company is also based in, in Shenzhen. And we are um, very focused on enabling or enhancing creativity uh, using advanced technology and making it very simple for normal people to use. Thanks, Eric. Hi, I'm Brandon. I'm the Director of Research and Development uh, at 3D Robotics, another drone company uh, based in Berkeley, California, just across the bay. And uh, we make the, the Iris aircraft, which is over on the table there as well. And I think uh, what 3DR is fundamentally interested in, um, what I've spent a long time doing at 3DR and prior to that um, at UC Berkeley, actually, uh, is figuring out how to make robots like tools. So we all have things like washing machines in our houses and things that you wouldn't normally think of as a robot. Um, but in fact, they are. And uh, how do we take things like drones and have them be extremely useful in applications like agriculture, or in cinematography and um, a whole wide range of applications we haven't even thought of yet. Okay. Alexandra? Finally, my turn. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex. Um, I am part of Aldebaran Robotics, and I am an engineer working with the NOW robot. Uh, we are integrating our little guy to, to be a social companion for people, to help everyone to work on social skills, on cognitive skills. So he will, you will find him um, working in education, for instance, uh, down from primary all the way up to universities for research. Okay. Well, what I find really interesting um, in the way they introduce themselves that nobody is really saying that I do robots. They, they talk about the problems they're really solving with machines, uh, either uh, with control or with artificial intelligence or like social, emotional aspects of robotics. So when we talk about robotics as a field, it feels like really kind of strange even to, to talk about that because you're in basically aerial imaging business plus probably like monitoring security. How, how would you describe the industries you're actually in? You, are you in robotics or are you in other things? Uh, well, I'll go first. We, um, yeah, we would say that we are in robotics. I mean, we're, we're taking physical objects and making them do things that are useful. Um, or So there would be things that are either either would have been impossible or things that result in a, you know exponential increase in efficiency or cost reduction. Mm. Uh, and so that's a, kind of a very bland way to say that we allow people to do amazing things with, with these products. Mm. Um, but what we're focused in is sort of unlocking that third dimension for physical placement of objects. You know, we happen to be doing cameras. Mm. Um, and we're also making those things very stable. So the stabilization of optics in space is kind of what we're focused on right now. But yeah, mm. fundamentally, they're robots. You have to get them there. They have to stay there by themselves without human interaction um, mm. and potentially make decisions on where to go. Okay. Would you describe your, what you guys are doing the same way? 
Yeah, underneath the hood, well, it's in the title, right? 3D Robotics. So <laughs> underneath the hood, we're all roboticists and nerds at heart, and um, that's very important to us. But actually, the way that we present that to others is very important. And I, I would say, actually, in the same way that GoPro sells itself as the world's leading activity capture company, 3D Robotics sells itself, or bills itself, as a company that makes tools for people that need to get jobs done. Now, sometimes those jobs are content creation in nature. Sometimes they're saving water in nature, in the, in the case on farms. And um, you know, if you try and sell a farmer a robot, um, they're gonna take all that baggage with them of what, you know, what they think robots are and what they think they should be. If you try and sell them a drone, they might even take that baggage with them. So in terms of perception, I'd say we're way more in, um, in the technology and problem solving space, content creation space, in particular, rather than uh, you know billing it as traditionally uh, robotic space. Okay, it seems like robotics is kind of a convergence of like machines and in the physical world and some form of autonomy and intelligence. And that the intelligence part is what you focus on, in, uh, on you said particularly in, in a, like unstructured, un unpredictable environments. So how do you like uh, what, what do you see as like the most interesting developments recently on the, on the intelligence side on the autonomy side? So one of the very concrete examples that some of you might have heard of was um, recent developments in computer vision. So last week, there was an article in the New York Times where people showed that actually five different research groups independently came up with the same thing, hmm. showing that you can machine learn to describe images. These were groups at Google, Baidu, Stanford, Berkeley, and Toronto, I believe. And so they were able to train a deep neural net from a lot of examples of what peop how people had described images, mm -hmm. how to describe new images that the system had never seen before. And kind of the reason I'm very excited about machine learning for robotics is that we see all these advances in machine learning where often they're driven by new amounts of data as well as some algorithmic innovation. And so having a lot more data come out will drive machine learning to become more and more successful. And so what I'm seeing in the future is that there will be more data about people's activities that robots can download. Robots can learn from watching people doing things. And the more data there will be, not just cats walking around, but maybe people cooking and so forth, um, the more the robots will be able to learn and integrate those skills into their own repertoire. Okay. I guess that's also part of what, what you guys are doing at Aldebaran, because the uh, on the drone side, obviously, the, the movement and the control is what's really critical. But for like a social and family robot and like, more focused on interaction with humans, like this le how important is this learning part? It's definitely very, very important, especially because when you welcome the robot in, into your family and close to you, um, now as a social robot. So we're focusing on developing a connection with the persons that he is interacting. Um, when you look at him, you'll see that he blinks, he's uh, reactive, he has sensors. If you touch him, he can feel in his hand, his, his feet, his head. Um, he's trying to communicate with people um, through a multi-model channel. But um, I think we're still a distance away from making the robot completely autonomous. But not only with now, but with every robot. Artificial intelligence still has a lot to evolve. Um, one of our platforms that we're working on right now is the Pepper robot, which resulted out of a very beautiful partnership with SoftBank. She is able, um, the robot is able to understand emotions and communicate with people and react based on um, how they are feeling. So we're definitely going forward and doing a lot of work. Um, I also have a question. Like Initially, there's always a lot of excitement. Every time there's something new, there's a, like a group of early adopters that jump onto it uh, because of novelty. Then there are also people who jump onto new things because they, it can help them do their jobs better. And at some point, some products can go to a mass market. Where do you think we are at today in terms of consumer robotics, uh, considering that probably the most popular robots you could qualify out there in consumer space would probably be the Roomba? I think sold about 10 million units. Um, probably, I don't know, Furby <laughs> that would qualify, right? <clears throat> it's kind of the most annoying robot ever. Um, and uh, like a lot of other like consumer type of ex experiments like uh, Sony's Ibo or uh, some of the like, uh, I think another robot that's actually picking up is probably robotic lawnmowers. Apparently, uh, I heard that in, uh, I think in Sweden last year there were 
about as many robotic lawnmowers sold as, as manual ones. So do you see other ones able to, like soon to cross the chasm to a mass market adoption? Which ones do you think are the most likely candidates? Like anyone who wants to take this question. I just want to throw one in the mix here sure. that you haven't mentioned yet, which is the Da Vinci built by Intuitive Surgical. Okay. And so this is not a consumer robot for peop most people like us, but for surgeons, this is a robot a lot of surgeons use. There's mm. a, um, thousands of them out there in hospitals. They're standardly used to remove gallbladders whenever that's necessary, and mm -hmm. surgeons are finding ways to use them for more and more uh, procedures as time goes by. And so I believe in the last year, just in the US, there were over half a million surgeries done with this robot. So just want to throw it in the mix as another application okay. area. So Not it's kind consumer of consumer level. It's, but it's prosumer robot, but what you're saying is that basically it already captured pretty much the market, uh, or a, a, large a large enough part of the market that you could consider it's really widespread for what it's supposed to do. Correct. Okay. Do, do you see other examples? Absolutely. I mean, I think, I think what we're doing at DJI, DJI is actually a very good example because mm -hmm. If you were to go on YouTube and do a search for aerial video uh, two years ago, you would find virtually 100% of them having been taken from a person flying. Um, now, the vast majority, you know, I think the last count was two or three million videos taken pretty much with the Phantom. And, you know, so we're seeing the beginnings of widespread mass adoption of aerial platforms for imagery. And, you know, in certain areas, like in this area, for example, if you go to virtually any park, you will see someone flying something. It's very normal here now, and you know, mm. you know, we're off an early indicator here, and mm. we're seeing that sort of spread. And um, so I'm very hopeful that um, aerial imagery will become just a standard thing, low altitude aerial imagery really as tools, as an, a tool for us. Mm. Um, and I think what made that happen was really out of the box ease of use. I mean, these technologies existed for a long time in research and in kit form for hobby. Mm. Um, but you know the fact that you have to take a soldering iron out to make something work mm. it automatically eliminates most people, um, mm. and, you know, for good reason. And so you know, being able to take something out of the box, polishing it to make it good enough, easy enough to use for most people okay. is really necessary for mass adoption. Like, I guess linked to that is also what was said on uh, like previous uh, previous interviews around the fact that the cost of components have gone down. So now you have really good cameras for really cheap. You have uh, like uh, engine like uh, motors that are also pretty pretty cheap. Um, but um, you're talking about like a, basically a fully packaged product, and you guys are more on the like, hobbyist type of market, where like with DIY, more the DIY type. So how, how do you see that? Yeah, crossing I mean, to that, mass that's market? certainly how 3D robotics got its start, and it's um, it's an incredible uh, engine for innovation and new applications for things. Uh, there's a website DIY Drones that you can go to that 3D robotics was born out of, and if you have a question uh, that starts with "Can a drone do X?" Uh, the answer to it is on DIY drones. There's 50,000 act active users, and people go there and try everything. And what we found is that we started the business with these hackable drones and people piecing things together and kind of searching out what they would be useful for. Um, and, and much probably the same way that the Roomba market evolved or any other consumer robotics market, there was a big exploration period and people identified a particular application that they were useful for. As time has gone on for 3D robotics, we've learned that while there are the hackers and the geeks out there who love doing this stuff, there's people who like really well-packaged products uh, that can go out there and get a job done of multiple forms, you know, not just multi-rotors, fixed-wing mm -hmm. aircraft, boats, all, all, of the, all of the autonomous vehicles under the sun. And um, I think the thing that really defines all of them, especially for 3D robotics, is accessibility, uh, which has a lot to do with price. You know, these things were previously military technology. Um, and now we're quite inexpensive, so that um, we see tons of people like uh, land and resource management people, people who work in national forests using them to do things that they mm -hmm. weren't able to do previously, could not do uh, due to price limitations. Okay. I actually would like to ask uh, to our audience here, who are obviously interested in robotics, like, who among you has tried flying a drone already? Flying a drone. So if you tried to fly a drone before, you raise your hand. Okay, who owns a drone? Just one, two, three, four, five. Okay, not that widespread. Very enthusiastic. Who wants to buy one for Christmas? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if it's, let's say, it's, if it's $100, all right, $100 maybe? Okay, a few more people. $1,000? A <laughs> few people, okay. Uh, so it's interesting because, um, I mean, I think, as you said, that there's already some, um, some usages that are pretty clear for people who like to do photography on imagery and 
maybe inspection and stuff. And I, I even start to hear about like weird or, or even um, like reprehensible usages of drones. <laughs> um, like I, I can think at least of two. Like recently, um, I think there was in uh, in France um, a drone, an, an unidentified drone was um, flying over a nuclear plant multiple times. So people started to wonder, what is this drone doing? Like, what kind of images is it capturing? Is it doing like thermal imaging to try to see how they could, you know, damage the the plant? So that was one. And uh, remember another one. I don't know if you guys saw that on the internet. There was um, this lady sunbathing on uh, on the the rooftop, and then the drone comes over, and you see the shadow of the drone on on the girl who's like just in the sun like this, and she tries to you know get it get the drone to to fly away, and she couldn't know who was flying it, where it was coming from. And uh, definitely kind of intimidating that where well, you feel there's some kind of surveillance uh, from, um, I mean, it's already bad enough when it's the government or the city uh, looking at you, but when it's like an identified eye flying around you, it's also pretty, uh, pretty annoying. Uh, do, is that something that comes up like in your community of, uh, of users, like uh, people using drones for things that probably they shouldn't do? Sure. Uh, like any, any new technology, there's going to be people who are going to use it for nefarious purposes and... Um, I think that it's important to keep in mind, you know, what are they actually useful for versus what could you use them for? Because, mm. in fact, you know, if, if uh, Eric and I were to fly our aircraft right now, you would all hear them and you'd all see them. They're actually quite loud. They're quite big. Um, and while they can be used for all these purposes in the same way that the, the Internet can be used for both wonderful and terrible things, mm. you know, what, what's the most likely thing for it to be used for? What's actually you know, useful and enjoyable uh, for us. Yeah, I, I'm not saying you guys have a responsibility to that. I, oh, no, I don't yeah. know how you fly your drone. Um, but uh, what, I, I'm, what I'm talking about is more about probably there will be some need, some need to evolve some, potentially some regulation around uh, like what's allowed, what's not allowed. And like some, some cities try to go uh, like very ha like harsh regulation saying you cannot fly anything and some others saying, oh, it's like a kite, more or less. So it's a yeah, it's a really complicated issue right now. Mm -hmm. And virtually every government in the world is working on ways to responsibly regulate them um, mm -hmm. and to allow use for the, the very, you know, the very useful things that they can do. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the things that you're talking about, for example, privacy, I mean, there are, are already existing laws that, that prevent people from spying. Um, and this is just another way to do mm -hmm. something that's already not allowed. You know, so I think people mm. are sort of exploring because they're not sure what's, you know, they're excited about new technology. Mm. But, I mean, I've said this in the past, I, I really can't wait until this technology is boring mm. because they really just are tools for doing useful yeah, things. Yeah. And we, you know, that's what they're for. I guess people's behaviors and uh, regulations are, are going to catch up. Uh, what, what do you see in, uh, so you're in the space of even a more challenging space because you're getting robots in the home, in front of people, uh, interacting, like, with, with children. Like, there's always a... A lot of concerns for any robot that goes around, any, any machine going around children. So uh, had, how do you man manage this, uh, the level of expectations people have in interactions and the uh, level of safety? Uh, how do you manage this emotional communication you want to establish? Like, uh, are there some, uh, some ideas you can share around those topics? Well, I'm actually going to give you a, a more particular example uh, on our applicability. For instance, working with children. We work with children with autism to enhance their social skills. So we have a set of applications based on ABA, teach, PECS, and other autism therapies. Um, we work directly with the teacher to develop these applications. We pair up teachers and developers. And at the end, we have an interface where you can launch and customize the applications as well as just record the data of the children, so record the interactions, their progress across time. And this, yes, um, our system does process a lot of the sensitive information of these children. Um, the school needs to be aware of that. And of course, they have control, full control over what happens with the robot within their institution. Hmm. Um, we have monitoring systems. You can, um, the robot can, can use his camera to monitor the children, for instance. And um, there always is a teacher there that manages this data that is processed. Okay. In terms of uh, like emerging categories of robots, so we talked about drones, uh, we talked a bit about uh, like uh, home robotics, and uh, we mentioned, of course, like the, the Roomba vacuum cleaner, the lawnmower, which is basically a Roomba that cuts grass, uh, pretty much. Do you see other categories of robots that 
would be emerging soon. Um, when people think of robots, generally they think either humanoid robots, like in old science fiction style, or they think uh, robotic arm from the factory. And it's very difficult to find things in, in between. So do, do you have other examples of robots you see emerging and you find particularly interesting? Yeah, I, I actually have a few that I've been thinking of a lot, which are these kind of passive listener robots. You know, we, we see them in the form of like Nest and Dropcam and now Amazon Echo. You know, these devices that just sit there and listen to what we say or do. And they mm. have all sorts of sensors in them. Um, but they don't interact necessarily with you in the physical world, except that maybe you say, I'd like to, you know, I, I ran out of toilet paper, mm. and then two days later, toilet paper appears at your door because Amazon heard it, and they know that you've blessed that product. Okay, so it's so, more closer to AI combined with sensors. Yeah, and, and, and the action being taken in the virtual world, mm. which has the potential to kick off some kind of physical interaction. Mm. So I think that space is, is I mean, I, I'm really looking at those products. So, I'm very so something curious. smarter than just the, the automatic door. Right, right. <laughs> yes, yeah. That would be like the, the level one. Right. OK, right. that's interesting. Well, how, how, do you, how do you think about this? Well, there are a couple of areas where people are pushing forward. Um, one of them is in manufacturing. So mm -hmm. people are trying to scale down manufacturing batches to smaller sizes and still make them productive. So they're looking at how to set up robotic manufacturing lines with much quicker turnaround in terms of setting them up than they could do before. Mm. And so an example of a company looking at that is Rethink Robotics. Yep. They have the Baxter robot, and so they're trying to get the robot out there, help people manufacture maybe a batch of 10,000 rather than a million, and still be productive. And those robots are very different from what we've seen so far in manufacturing, because these robots are safe around people, which mm. is a big difference, because now you can have people and robots collaborate and some difficult things maybe could still be done by people, but the simpler things, the more repetitive things, the robot could do right next to the person. Mm. So that, that's one angle. I think the other angle is, is the angle Steve Cousins was presenting about, which is this idea of moving towards the home, but picking big homes, so to say, like hotels, where you get the economy of scale, where you get many beds, many bathrooms. So if you just build a bathroom cleaning robot, you have it at home, can clean your bathroom once a day, sure, maybe it's busy for half an hour if it's really thorough, but, but after that it's done. If you have a hotel, bigger environments where you have repetition, uh, it might be much more economic, economically beneficial to have one of those robots. So you, here you're talking about like uh, what uh, at the same time is great and at the same time scares some people that robots are taking our jobs, right? I mean, that's something that comes probably all the time uh, when you do any sort of, uh, of automation. And the, without entering that debate, it's about like, what kind of tasks are repetitive enough and potentially like, complex enough that they, but they could still be automated. Uh, like you're talking about cleaning bathrooms and that's probably a, in a hotel, if all is the same, all, all the equipment is always the same, maybe it's e easier to do, but if it starts to vary, that's where like, robots with intelligence uh, start to really make a difference because they can like, deal with different environments and uh, be, um, be more, more flexible, I guess. So do you have also other examples of uh, robots you see emerging on applications? Um, I, I actually have a very good example of Lego Mindstorms. Lego Mindstorms. Who doesn't have, uh, I mean, it's, it's very important. Kind of toy educational to, robot. Yeah, but you can apply them to, to anything. If you're an enthusiast and you want to make something of your own, Lego Mindstorm is very accessible and very easy to get. Mm. Um, also, you can use it with children to, to make them develop small applications. Mm. Actually, um, it's, it's interesting you mentioned Lego Mindstorms because I remember visiting uh, an animation studio in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually got uh, uh, an Oscar for the short movie that they did on the, the Gruffalo. I don't know if you guys know this, this movie. Uh, and they had a stop motion set that was made with Lego. And because it was so hacked, the camera was mounted on this like, uh, Lego thing on the rail and it would move, and then it would have to wait for about 30 seconds before taking a, like a, a, a photo to make sure it was really stable. And then it would move again and take a photo. So that was like basically building systems, uh, like for professional systems out of, uh, out of things that initially looked like toys. Mm -hmm. so that's really interesting um, avenue for, for, expo like for developing more um, let's say robotic systems. The, do, you, do you know uh, other examples you can think of? No, but I, you I guys? want to continue. I can ah, okay. actually Sorry. give you an example of its applicability for museum science, for instance. Um, recently, they built um, a system reproducing an ancient computer using Lego Mindstorms, and they were able to better understand and predict the movements of that particular system. Okay. Um, actually, um, 
kind of impeding a little bit on the discussion here, but as, a, as an accelerator, so I mentioned we had six robotic companies in the last batch we graduated. I just want, want to mention them really briefly because I think they, they show also an interesting variety. Uh, one is a, a, a basically a, a robot for biotech called OpenTrons that's basically doing all the, the hand, if you're a biotech lab, what you do is you, you look at an experiment, you design an experiment, and then you do hand pipetting for many hours, like moving little amounts of liquid to, from one pipette to another, uh, from one uh, thing to another. And then you do the analysis. And the hand pipetting part is actually about two thirds or three quarters of your time, and it's really a waste of time. So they built a robot that looks a little bit like a makerbot, like a three axis type of thing, that can do all the automation for the pipetting so that the, the lab people can actually focus on the really high value tasks. So I think this one was really interesting. And another one, like talking about uh, uh, sensors and low cost robotics, is um, uh, actually the robot in the pet technology space. So there's more and more companies looking at things to, for pets. So there's uh, things to deliver food for pets, to take care of your pets when you're away. On the, um, but there's also um, robotics. And uh, this company has created a robotic mouse with intelligence so that it can play with your cat. It looks a little bit crazy, but the fact is that domestic cats are natural hunters, and they can't hunt in the house, generally, unless you don't take very good care of your house. So, they, they start to feel a bit uh, restless, and they start to destroy things, and uh, feel unhappy, and also they don't get to exercise as much. So this robot actually has a 360 vision, and uh, intelligence is made by three uh, robotics uh, uh, engineers. And it can see the cat coming, and wait until the cat is really close, so that it will escape the cat and make it totally crazy. So it's, uh, it's really interesting, like if you want to check it out, I think it's still on Kickstarter, it's called um, uh, Mauser by Petronix. So that, just two examples of things we maybe wouldn't expect as robots, but uh, one in the biotech lab, very low cost, like two, three thousand dollars machine, and the other one is basically, you could say a toy for cat, it's actually a very sophisticated robot with robot vision and intelligence that retails for like a bit more than a hundred dollars. So I guess that those are the type of like in, intelligent robots you, you, you guys are working on in your lab. The, uh, more the, the, the pet robot type of thing. It'd be great to build a robot with the intelligence of a pet, but uh, it's still <laughs> far away. <laughs> well, they're, yeah, they're, you're getting close, right? I mean, it's not exactly a pet, but it's kind of companion robot at Aldebaran, right? Yes. And we're, we're also looking at very different profiles and very different markets because uh, different people have different needs. For instance, the elderly population. What, what can we do to better assist them to not only provide companionship, but also provide um, robots that could be their assistant, right? Help mm. them with their age, remind them to take their medicine. Um, again, the chil children, we want them to become scientists, right? And um, train their minds and, and expose them to different cognitive processes. So we want to expose them to coding, to mm. sciences, to STEM education. Again, I think robotics is definitely a channel that could excite them and entertain them as well as really teach them at the same time. Okay. I think we just have a few minutes, so I'll ask uh, each of you uh, a few words to conclude about uh, what you think are the next uh, developments on exciting opportunities around robotics or, or, or in particular with, with your company. Uh, do you want to start, maybe? Sure. I would say for the things we're looking at in my lab, what right now is really starting to make a big difference is two things. One is lots of data, people doing things and analyzing that automatically. The other thing is lots of computation. Because when you have lots of mm. computation, you can try things out in simulation. And you can have the robot learn in simulation how to do things parallelized over many machines. And so that's starting to make a big difference too. Mm. Uh, yeah, I would say that we're really excited about the idea of packaging more sensors into these platforms. Um, you know, we're, we've talked to a lot of companies who are looking for um, uh, like a commodity hardware product, commodity robotics platform mm -hmm. from which they can develop. I mean, these companies may consider themselves actually to be software companies, and ha they happen to be making hardware because no one's making the hardware. And, and so you so, mean, mean like kind of building blocks type of companies, like was mentioned a bit earlier? Uh, but, but building blocks in big chunks, you know, like okay. if you can position something somewhere arbitrarily, that's a pretty big building block. Mm. Um, and so, you know, the, the tasks may be, um, you know, up to the person. We don't really care what people are going to do with it, but you can do a lot with them. So 
I think integrating sensors so that you know, there's more of a potential to harness app algorithms, interesting algorithms that people are using so that we can develop things like Sense and Avoid and other key technologies. So do, do you keep an eye on research done by labs and uh, have, uh, definitely, have connections with yeah, them? Okay, absolutely. excellent. How about you guys? Yeah, so um, I, I think where robots, uh, where robots get interesting is where they're really tightly coupled with um, with the world in its full, you know, unstructured glory around us. It's very easy to make a robot that operates and does one very, very specific task or one that would vacuum this stage, but it turns out um, that a lot of the world is just unstructured. There's steps, there's windows that you have to go through, and um, I think in addition to computation and adding more sensors, certainly adding more battery power to, to, for aircraft in particular, which is hugely important, actually giving them the ability to understand the environment that they're in and make judgment calls based on that. This is obviously mm -hmm. a huge topic in university research. This is you know, the types of things that Peter works on, but which portions of that are actually gonna be useful for, for people? Uh, you know, to give a quick example, in drones, people always talk about sense and avoid and how that's very important. And there's certainly subsets of that are really, that are really important, like avoiding trees. You know, if we had a, mm -hmm. a tree avoiding detector, that'd probably solve 90% of our sense and avoid problems, or if we could even mm -hmm. fly through trees. So I think it's a combination of the sensors, the actuators, and that intelligence to be able to navigate in these environments that are varying and really hard to operate in. Okay, excellent. I believe in context-driven robotics. Um, for instance, humans are very social creatures. We want to be comforted, but we also want to be stimulated and um, guided in the right path, something that's challenging, but at the same time, we can relate to. Um, what not, why not having a robot in your home that can sense that you're feeling a little sad that day and play your favorite song because he happens to have paid attention and know what your favorite song is? Or help you cook, uh, pull out a recipe for your favorite, uh, favorite food and cook it together. I, I believe in robotics that is there to, to help people and enhance their lifestyle and enhance their, their quality of life. That's a pretty positive outlook on robotics <laughs> that we can probably close the panel with. So thanks a lot uh, to uh, Peter, Eric, Brandon, and Alex. And if you want to reach out to them, they're probably going to be around for a little bit more. So thank you very much.